growing up, I was much more connected with my sisters and my mom than I was with my dad. I had really identified with my mom and I grew up playing games a lot with my sisters, the kinds of things that they would play. And some of my earliest memories are of being involved sexually with other young boys. When I was in kindergarten and first and second grade, there were some boys in the neighborhood and we would do things sexually. And I think um, because of those experiences, I, I pulled away from boys and from friendship with boys. One of, the, one, one of the lessons that I learned was that if you get close to a guy, it's going to turn sexual. And, and I didn't want that to happen. And it, it wasn't like I was being molested, but I think they affected me like a sexual abuse would have in that I felt a lot of shame and guilt for those experiences. I remember when I was in junior high, I, would, I, I was thinking back about the sexual experiences I'd had as, as a kid, and I would pray over and over again for forgiveness. I felt a lot of intense guilt and shame about those experiences. And I was, um, I was pretty disconnected from my father. I didn't, we didn't connect very well. He was very busy with work and with his involvement with the church. And when I was in junior high, um, like a lot of boys, I discovered pornography and books with sexual scenes in them and um, began to look more and more for those. And then my interest in the books began to turn, and the pornography began to turn towards the men in the pictures and in the scenes. And I, I was quickly getting hooked on those things. And and I was afraid because, I, you know, I, I grew up in the church. I knew what the Bible said about sexuality. I knew that God intended marriage um, to be the place for sexual intimacy um, between a man and a woman. And yet here I was. I was a believer. I, I accepted Jesus into my heart when I was five. And I studied the Bible and I memorized scripture. And yet here I was. I had these sexual attractions and, and I didn't know what to do with it. People in the church weren't really talking about those things back then and and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to turn for that. I talked to God but I didn't really know how to hear God and I think because of the sexual experiences and because of um, the way I was a, as a kid that I grew up a lot in my head. There wasn't really much of a heart connection with God. I, I believed very strongly what the Bible said. I believed in Jesus, but I, I didn't hear God in that way. And so a lot of my talking to God was praying for forgiveness over and over again, and then making vows you know, not to do things again, not to, not to look at porn again, and then trying really hard to be good. And so I spent a lot of time trying really hard to be good, and, and I was a good Christian kid. Um, I, I was involved in Sunday school. I was a leader in our youth group sang in the choir. Um, I went on missions trips. And then when I graduated from high school, um, spent a couple years in college. And then I took three years and had a year in Bible college and then went overseas for two years as a missionary. And we evangelized people. We told people the gospel. I preached. But, you know, I was really working really hard to be good enough and to try to be better. I figured if I prayed hard enough, and did the right things, this would go away. My homosexual feelings, and they weren't going away. I think there was a lot of envy. I wanted to be those guys in the picture, and I wanted to have sex with them. And that's what scared me, was that's who I was really attracted to. I wanted to be with those guys. I wanted to be sexual with them. And I don't think I, don't think I called it homosexuality for a long time. I think I was really trying to suppress the feelings for a lot of years, trying to be good and trying to work hard and do the right things, but they would, they kept creeping up. And I, you know, people in the church weren't talking about, you know, how to handle pornography or addiction or broken sexuality, at least in the church I grew up in. We were, um, there was a lot of emphasis on doing the right things and on learning the word, memorizing it, understanding the word, studying it. Um, and trying to apply it, but there wasn't a whole lot of grace involved and there wasn't a lot of instruction about how God actually brings change into our lives. And so I just kept thinking, if I know the Bible better and if I study hard enough and if I pray hard enough, I'll, I'll change. I kept looking 
for God to change me, sort of an instant healing, and, and that wasn't happening. And I was getting really tired of having these attractions and fighting them and failing constantly and, and then feeling shame over my failure. I felt an intense amount of shame and, and embarrassment and loneliness for even having these feelings. And I, I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know who to talk to. For me, there was a lot of envy and I really wanted to be those men. I was hungry for their masculinity, or what I saw was their masculinity in those pictures. And the parts of their bodies that I was attracted to, that's what I was looking at, was their masculinity. And I think that was because I didn't feel very masculine as a kid. I didn't feel like one of the boys. I didn't feel connected to the world of men. I was still, in many ways, living in the world of my mom and the world of women. All through junior high and high school, my friends were girls. I, I had some guys that were friends, but I was never very close to them and didn't feel really connected to them. And I, I felt like an outsider with the guys, and I was hungry for masculinity and for male connection. And I think that's some of what I was looking for in the pornography was that masculinity. But you don't, you don't get masculinity through sex and not through solo sex either. So it wasn't happening. I went to this conference and that was the first time I ever heard that there might be some reasons why I was having these attractions and that change was possible, that there were people who had come out of homosexuality, that God had brought into freedom. And I'd grown up in the church, I'd been a missionary, I'd studied the Bible, and I'd never heard that message before. And for me, that was life-changing. Within a week of the conference, I started seeing a Christian counselor, and I started going to a support group in San Diego called Homosexuals Anonymous. Um, and that was a, a step group that was Christ-centered and biblically based. And you didn't stand up every week and say, hi, I'm Jeff and I'm gay. You would stand, um, actually one of the steps was about how um, those who struggle with homosexuality have often accepted a false identity, that being gay is who they are and that their attractions define them. And another step talks about how we're all part of God's heterosexual creation, that God intended for us to grow healthy or sexual in a healthy way, but that that can get distorted by a lot of different things. So I started attending that group and then I started talking to people about my struggles with same-sex attractions and I eventually told my parents and some friends of mine and they were very gracious and accepting and they supported the fact that I wanted to change. I attended an Exodus conference for the first time and discovered that there was a whole network of organizations that was helping people who wanted to deal with same-sex attractions and I knew that I was going to have to decide between being gay or following Christ. Either. I couldn't be a gay Christian. I knew too much scripture for that and wasn't able to twist my head around their theology enough to, to believe that. But eventually what I decided that was that I was going to follow Christ whether or not my feelings ever changed, whether or not the attractions ever went away. And so the first thing I did, I went to an Exodus conference and I met a woman there and I remember feeling very strongly that I was supposed to go ask her to pray with me. And she prayed with me, and one of the things she prayed, she asked God to break doctrinal bondage. And my first thought was, you can't pray that. And then I thought, she's right. I need to be set free from some of the things that I believe doctrinally that aren't correct, that aren't true. And we met another time for prayer. And it was interesting, right as I was deciding to turn back to Christ, I met this guy that was really attractive and really smart and he was gay, and I thought, well, maybe I'm supposed to minister to him. Maybe I'm supposed to save him, you know, and, and tell him the gospel. And I was really confused because I had all these feelings for him, and, and yet I wanted to follow Christ. And I went to this woman again and asked her to pray for me, and she said, well, how are you feeling about all this? And I said, I feel confused. And she said, well, who is the author of confusion? And I thought, the enemy. And I have to not see this guy again. You know, I don't need to save him. One savior is enough. And I thought, I'm going to go 
back to pursue Christ and to pursue healing, but I'm going to do it a little bit differently. I had all this head knowledge about homosexuality. I understood the roots in my head. But everything that I read said it was a relationship problem. And I knew that I needed to work on some of my relationships. So when I went back to the church, I started pursuing relationships with men in the body, healthy, non-sexual relationships with guys. And there was one man who discipled me, and I met um, weekly with two guys for prayer and relationship and accountability. We met for a year and then I met with two other guys for two years and I joined a home group and I learned to open up about what was going on inside and I also learned at the same time how to receive healing from God. I had a friend who was discipling me and he asked me to write down on a sheet of paper who God was. And I, had, I covered the page with scripture and with descriptions of God, that God is light and God is holy and that he's omnipotent and omnipresent and all those things. And my friend looked at the sheet of paper and he said, okay, now I want you to flip it over and write down how you feel about God. And that was a revelation to me because instantly I knew how I felt about God. I felt that he was distant and that he was angry with me, that he was punitive, that he didn't listen to me. And of course, I, that was my heart view. That was what I really believed inside, that God um, didn't love me, that he didn't answer prayer and didn't listen to me, and that he was very angry with me. And that was a revelation for me, really understanding how I felt about God on the inside. One of the things that was really helpful for me in receiving healing was learning how to confess what I'd done. And, and not just to confess the action, but to confess what was going on underneath. Not just, oh, I went and had sex with this guy, but um, you know, I used somebody as an object for my pleasure, and I had envy towards them and lust towards them, and I would confess some of the underlying emotions. And then I learned that God loved me as I was, and that I didn't have to work for his grace. And I learned how to begin to receive his grace and forgiveness. And so it was through the process of beginning to confess to people that I trusted and having them pronounce forgiveness over me, God's forgiveness, that I began to receive that forgiveness in my heart and my heart began to change. And then gradually some of the events from my childhood God began to bring those things up one at a time in times of healing prayer or at conferences or different places, and he would bring healing to those events. For example, I remember one conference where I was sitting in a class on healing sexual abuse, and the speaker was talking about the pain of sexual abuse. And I thought to myself, what pain? I, I had sexual encounters with little boys, and I didn't feel any pain in any of this. And then a few days later, during worship, I began to feel this intense pain in my stomach welling up. And I grabbed a friend of mine and we went outside to pray. And for about two hours, I cried out the pain of when I was a little kid. And it, it was the oddest experience. It was like I was, I was in my late 20s, but I was also six years old again. And I was saying, I just wanted to be friends with them. And I didn't want to do anything sexual. And, and I just wanted, to get close to guys. And so it's like God was reaching back in time and bringing healing to that little six, seven-year-old kid who had done these things with other little boys but didn't really want, want to, that wanted to be friends with them. And so I learned, one of the things that I learned too was that oftentimes in the church, we tell people, yeah, you're saved by grace, but now that you're saved, you gotta do this, 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 and this, and this. And so we lay this list of things on people that they, that they gotta do. You gotta read your Bible, you gotta pray, you gotta worship, you gotta fellowship, you gotta tithe, you gotta do this. And in some ways it's almost like we're preaching another gospel like Paul talks about in Galatians where he says there's just one gospel, God sets you free by his grace. And as I began to realize that deep in my heart, I realized that so much of what I had been doing as a kid and as a young adult, so much of my service for God had been to work 
for grace, to work to be good enough. And grace doesn't come that way. Grace is a gift. And it brings freedom and life. It doesn't bring bondage. And I was going deeper and deeper into bondage as a Christian rather than more and more into freedom as a Christian. And Christ began to set me free through His grace. And I learned how to receive His grace rather than having to work to earn it all the time. Pure passion that beats for Christ alone.